Hello everyone. This is the Probability and Statistics Review Lecture. I'm Mark Crowley, and today we're going to be talking about all the basic definitions of probability, probability distributions, random variables, and some fundamental measures of uncertainty and probability and differences or distances between distributions to get us all started. This is going to be very useful throughout the, the course and throughout your career. Um, and you probably know some of these things already. So if you are an expert in probability statistics and have lots of this background, you can comfortably skip this. I'm not going to use any non-standard notation. Just want to introduce the concepts and um, or refresh them for everyone if it's been a long time. Um, sometimes people don't use a lot of this in their day-to-day, -day, um, but the more and more you get into data analysis and artificial intelligence and machine learning, the more and more you have to think about these things. Because what is the world but a um, large system of, uh, of variables of uncertainty and where we're trying to make predictions in our, our daily lives either for our job or ourselves um, everything's about probability and variables and values that you're tracking and estimating um, there's very little that is certain we don't live in a particularly um, deterministic universe or deterministic universe at all, depending on, on how we interpret physics. So even if we did, we wouldn't know everything, right? So the uncertainty that we have about what's going on right now is always there, and there's methods for assessing that. As an engineer, as a software developer, as a computer scientist, a data scientist, you're going to be dealing with that in a very concrete way. So we're going to talk about the rules of probability and what that means. Um, but in a broader sense, it is about, you know, life and how to solve problems in the world. And hopefully that's what we're all trying to do. And one of the first things, the most important things to recognize that really, strangely, wasn't recognized until, you know, the last few decades, I guess, um, in some ways in, in machine learning or in artificial intelligence is that um, probability and uncertainty are really fundamental to it. Um, and they're, they're the first thing you should be thinking about, not a later thing that you tack on to um, logic or even statistics. Um, and a statistics has its own kind of approach. Um, so you can come at the content here and the content of this course from different directions. Um, you can come out of statistics and go through a lot of the things we'll talk about here and then lead to some of the algorithms we'll talk about in the course and to see them all as extensions of statistics. Um, you can come out of pure math and see them a different way. You can come out of computer science or um, engineering or software development and come at these things we're going to talk about today almost as side background issues that you need to fill in because the fundamental to you is the computer or the computational mechanism or the machine that you're building. Um, so none of those ways is more correct than another, but it's just important to, to check your, your assumptions about what's important um, and never underestimate how important <laughs> uncertainty and probability are um, because the, the longer we go on and the, the deeper we get and the, the more successful these algorithms and methods become, it usually comes back to understanding these kind of things better um, because the, the world is a fundamentally noisy, stochastic place and we have an uncertain set of observations of it. So it's never good to over become, be overconfident about what you see. Um, so what we're going to talk about here is um, the fundamentals of uh, probability, some of these methods I was talking about. Um, and some, some definitions that are going to be useful, and also some ways of assessing confidence and certainty, um, or measures of uncertainty along the way. So, what is probability? 
That's the very first um, question, and there's various different ways to define it. I'm going to define it one particular way, and I have notes um, on a website that I'll, I'll link to. You guys have links to for the course, where there's kind of all these this notes about these fundamental definitions of sample spaces and variables um, in more detail, but I'll just kind of outline it here. So we start with A sample space of events. What's an event? An event is a thing that happen, happens, right? So it could be um, rolling a dice, it could be crossing the street, it could be making a phone call, it could be opening your eyes. Every time something happens, there. Um, Is an outcome, there's a state of the world that occurs, and one way of defining probability is saying that there is a set of all the possible um, things that could occur, which is the sample space, which I'm, um, which we'll define as omega, um, which is a set of all the things um, that could occur. And then An event an event itself A is an event that is a subset of all the possible things that could occur. Um, and this could be all the outcomes, all the possible outcomes. Of um, an experiment or an action. That was taken, right? So like rolling a dice is our typical example. And then um, And then we're going to talk about a probability measure, which is what we really talk think of as a as a probability. Um, as a as a function. That has three ways of uh, three kind of fundamental properties. And that's supposed to be a, well, I can always use a lowercase a. I don't really distinguish. Um, is that for every um, outcome, every event a, its uh, probability has to be greater than zero. And the second outcome is that um, if some events Are what we call disjoint. Then the um, the probability of both the events happening is the same as the probability of. The um, 
the sums of the events individually. Because so I can get rid of, well, I can just use an index. Right, so or, or literally just saying PA1 plus PA2. All right, so there's two events and they say there's disjoint. And by disjoint, we mean um, they cannot happen at the same time, right? Either one happens or the other happens. This is like the numbers on a dice coming up, right? Either a two comes up or a four comes up or a six comes up, but you can't get multiple numbers show up at the same time on the same dice. If you have two dice, that's different. Then we're talking about a different setup, right? So if they um, are disjoint events that cannot occur simultaneously, then you can just add the probabilities together. And that's the same as saying, what's the probability of rolling a two and a four on a single dice? You implicitly saying, what's the probability of rolling a two and a probability of rolling a four independently? And then the other aspect is that the sum of um, the probability of omega of all the events is one. Right, so if we take all possible subsets of um, of the events that occur, they have to add up to one. So those are the three fundamental probability rules there, which we often also call the axioms of probability. And there's different ways um, to express them, but that's the main idea. So from these basic axioms, a lot of other rules about probability can flow outwards. If we um, describe the one kind of notational thing that isn't actually used immediately, will come later. Um, uppercase, we're kind of talking about um, the entire event. So it could be a binary event. So like flipping a coin has a tails or um, calling a number and decide and hearing whether they're going to pick up or not. Uh, more multi-valued, like a dice um, rolling between one and six on a, on a normal dice. Um, that's saying, we're just saying, what's the probability of this event happening, of the dice roll um, in general? So talking about the distribution. But if we say a particular element, so if we're saying it's the probability of, of rolling that dice, <clears throat> six-sided dice, um, six-sided die, I guess you say, but it's a dice. Um, a six-sided dice, then we'd say, what's well, the probability that you'd roll um, a five when you roll this dice, All right? So we might then also just say probability of five, although in reality, we would usually have some variable that assigns to that. So we'd say D equals five, um, you'd say probability of D, and um, that would be the probability of this particular instance. So lowercase is just going to be in a particular event that takes long, and uppercase is going to be, like lowercase is a particular instance, um, and uppercase is the entire event. So we have these other um, rules. So we have um, disjoint probability of um, disjunction. So the probability of um, here, right, this is the symbol for or, right? So probability of P, uh, probability P of A or B happening. Um, so in your dice, you could be saying um, probability of um, rolling a um, two or a four on a single um, cube dice, right? Um, and so there's six possibilities, so the probability of that is two um, out of six. So there's a third, 30%, uh, a one third chance, right, that you'll roll um, a two or a four. So the probability of these things happening is, um, if you have a disjunction like this, you're saying I want two, multiple different events to, ha to, to occur, and I want to know the probability of them happening. Um, you can compute it by taking the um, sums of the individual events, right? Because for us rolling a two, what was the probability of rolling a two just on its own? One sixth, right? There's six options. There's one sixth um, probability of, uh, of rolling it. And same for rolling a four. 
Um, but the point you have to correspond for then is that um, if they are able to happen um, simultaneously, then you need to subtract that probability of them both occurring. Because here you're saying, what's the probability of rolling uh, a two or a four? In our case, um, they are, are mutually exclusive, right? Or disjoint, like we said before. Um, and so adding them together is sufficient. So the more general version of this is like, well, if they're not disjoint, so if the events can co-occur, then you could say, what's the probability of two different stocks that you're tracking hitting a certain level um, today, right? So you have stock A, it goes up a certain amount, um, and you have stock B, it goes up a different amount. Um, you might have some model about whether they're going to go up or down, so you have a probability that they're going to um, cross a certain threshold, and um, that would be, and you, all you really even know is what either of them, is either of them going to go over the level, because that means I'll have to get, call someone and sell some stocks or something. Um, and so you'd have to take the probability of each one happening individually and then subtract the possibility that they could both happen, which should be less likely, you'd imagine, um, because it is possible for both these events to occur as well, right? Um, so that's for disjoint. Um, for joint probabilities, so if we use a, an or like that, um, we uh, we mean that they we want one of them to happen. If we use a comma, I mean in logical notation, you could use and. This doesn't come up a lot in um, our field, but it's clear, right? So A and B happening, you're really now saying that I want to know of both of these occurring. So you're only caring about this situation where both of them have happened. In a dice, two events can't happen, right? So you must mean that they are um, that they're disjoint, um, or you must mean it over multiple rolls, right? Otherwise, it wouldn't make sense because on a single roll of a dice, you can't get multiple values. Um, so that's that's joint probability of, of multiple events occurring. And there's rules for breaking these down um, into uh, what we call uh, conditional probabilities. So the chain rule is kind of the first most fundamental uh, element of, of conditional probabilities. So with our stock example, um, we're saying, well, what's the probability that um, stock A is going to go above this threshold that we've had, um, like it's going to go, it's going to increase by 100 points today. Um, given that uh, B has already done the same thing. Right, so the probability of A, given that B um, has this, has attained that probability, that event as well. So we have a conditional probability that essentially, um, if this is true, then we can talk about the probability of this being true or having a particular value um, and that they have a relationship. And so the way you break this down, when you know there's a joint distribution between the two of them, that you can break it down in this way where um, you have a conditional probability between them and then a um, unconditional um, probability on on the secondary event, right? So, and if you think of it, the kind of almost as like a graphical model, this is a way that it gets expressed in um, Bayesian networks. Essentially now in in this model here, we're expressing the, in this breakdown of the probability, we're expressing a model that says, um, event A is somehow influenced um, or at least our estimate or our understanding of A, our, our uncertainty about it, is influenced by our knowledge about B. It doesn't say that B causes A. This is a tricky and subtle point that doesn't always get captured, but um, it is saying that if we know what B is, then we can tell you what A is. And so the distribution of of this is, um, is A given B is expressed by this part, and then probability of A, B on its own is by this part, right? So we just say, well, my stock A um, went over, went up 100 points, um, and if it, if I knew that um, my IBM stock goes up 100 points, um, I have this pre-existing model that says, well, when Google stock goes up by 100 points, I have a, I know the likelihood that my IBM stock will go up by 100 points, right? But in order to have a full distribution now that fully explains this probability for it to be equal um, to the same distribution of um, 
A where there's no direction, um, we require this um, prior, right? So another thing that we call this is the prior probability. Um, and that's the idea in, the, in my case that um, what's the probability of Google going above 100 points just on its own, not, like not knowing any other knowledge, right? So you have a conditional model that tells you how one variable relates to another and you have a prior model that's unconditional and tells you about the entire system. So what we've done here is taking a, a two variable joint probability distribution and chained it out so that we have a conditional and a single variable distribution. That chain rule um, applies also in any length, any number of variables. So if you have a distribution over 100 variables, maybe 100 different stocks you're making predictions about, or maybe now you're predicting about a person in the lab around your robot and whether that person is going to step in front of you um, in the next minute. And so whether you should worry about avoiding them or just have your robot go straight across the room, right? And you've got 10 people in the room and you have to make predictions about all 10 of them, given their posture and their movement and their history, are they about to move, right? That could be what the variable is predicting. Um, and you could decide to break that down into a chain that says, um, because maybe you can't assess this entire distribution on its own, but you do have models like this that says, um, if, if one person is, um, is about to move, then I know somebody else is about to move, right? So maybe the likelihood of anyone getting up is related to other people getting up, which is kind of true. If somebody gets up in the room, um, there's likelihood other people will, right? So we've got this distribution, and then we have another, we have another model that says, well, I know if there's one person in the room and another two people get up, this guy is this likely to get up. So I know how to write down this distribution, this conditional distribution, and so on until we have all of them and so mathematically, we say that um, this is equivalent to this joint distribution as long as you break it down this way. Again, we have a, a prior um, distribution here, which has to say, like, what's the probability of this person getting up for no reason on their own? So you need to be able to have that. And often these kinds of ones are the, the harder ones to specify. So this is just this is a consistent way to break down that probability distribution, given the way probabilities work. Another way of looking at that and using that chain rule is a very useful um, fact, probably one of the most useful ones in terms of um, a lot of machine learning models, is this idea of marginalization. Um, we talk about a marginal distribution, or we'll often say um, we're using the concept of marginalization, or we'll say um, we'll say marginalize that you know, distribution um, or variable or something like that. And what we mean is to take advantage of um, of this fact. And this uses the, the same chain rule, right, which says we have a joint distribution between two variables. And if you, um, that should turn into a conditional distribution between the two of them and a prior on the other one. But then we also say, well, what if you knew the particular value of um, that variable with the prior, right? Then you'd say, um, so we have our stocks, right? So all the possible um, stocks A that B can depend on. Um, so all the other companies, we know all their values, whether they've gone up or not. And now we're really just talking about what's the probability of um, A going up given that knowledge, right? So we, um, what we also say is that we um, can also say that you, um, condition on B and basically marginalize it out. So essentially what a marginalization tells us is that um, the unconditional prior probability on some variable A could be seen as equivalent to um, the chain rule expanded form of that joint probability where the Bs are summed out. So we put sum out over every possible world, all the possible values of B um, and get these, these probabilities. Because the assumption is this is well-defined for every value. So for all my companies, we know the probability of that happening today. And we have a conditional probability that tells us the probability of 
this particular, some other company A going above that level if B does. And so these are known distributions that we have. Then we can compute A because we just sum through all the values of B and instantiate them, right? And so this will give you um, an actual um, number, right? In an actual probability, uh, this will as well, right? And uh, you multiply them together and you'll get another probability and you sum them together and you'll get a probability here. Another important way of dealing with these rules is to take the um, chain rule itself and turn it on its head, right? That's, it normally gives us this, right? Um, and so if we just move the, the prior on B over there, then we get this rule, which tells us that the uh, conditional probability of two variables is the ratio of the joint probability and the um, the prior, as long as this is a real probability. So you're kind of normalizing um, that joint probability by the likelihood of that one event happening, and that's what a conditional probability is. So these are all just equivalent ways of, of reformulating these distributions. And we'll see soon how, they, how it actually becomes very useful. Um, it's not just a bunch of arbitrary arithmetic. Another related fact from these, um, so we talk about uh, two variables being independent. Um, another way you can write that is this way. So X is independent of Y. Um, and we say that X is independent of Y only if um, it is the case that uh, their joint probability is the same as the product of their separate probabilities, right? So this relates to if, they're, if they are independent, then you want to Get the probability of both of them occurring, um, it's just going to be the same as multiplying them, which makes sense, right? Because you have to say, well, what's the probability of x happening, and then what's the probability of y happening, and they both have to happen. So it's like in each world, both of these unlikely things have to occur. Um, so you need a, a situation where things can happen simultaneously, and yet um, they don't influence each other. So the stocks and the companies are kind of part of that as well. Um, but if they had any relationship, a conditional um, connection between them that would explain it, then you wouldn't be able to do that. So in this case, we're saying there isn't any um, conditional relationship. We can still break them down into that rule and say that Px given gives y um, given, given y. But since we know that they're um, independent, that will be equivalent to the product of these. And if we see what happens from that, then um, we can just cross these out and we end up getting the product of x given y is the same as the product of x. And that's kind of saying that the probability of x is basically independent of uh, y. It doesn't rely on it at all, right? Um, and you didn't need to sum it out because we know we could sum out over y and make this happen, but that's not even required here. So we're just saying they're just not related. Um, another thing to point out, I kind of glossed over it there before, right, is that the way these get broken down in the chain rule, the order does not matter. So there's nothing in the rules of probability that says this way is more correct than this way. Um, they're both possible unless you know something about the model, right? Um, and to distinguish this, um, you really need to work out causality. And that's actually a very hard problem. Um, and so that's why, and we'll talk about this a bit in hypothesis testing, um, in order to distinguish that direction, you need to work out um, the causal relationship between the events. And that requires kind of controlling um, how they how they occur and what caused them to happen. So you kind of purposely change some variable and see what happens to the other one and, and test causality. And that's exactly how drugs get tested and most of um, experimental science happens in physics and chemistry and biology. They try something and they see because they want to work out which is it. It's very important to know 
which it is right? and physics will tell us you know that this explosion this reaction happens and then energy gets released as an explosion but a lot of the equations go in both directions but um, in biology and uh, medicine and, and engineering it's very important that we know the direction so to be careful you can break down distributions um, using these rules but these rules literally don't know about the direction of things and they don't care um, so if you do it the wrong way nothing will break in the math and yet your system might not function properly because you reversed maybe this one is possible and you have to investigate it and this one is nonsensical in terms of our physics in our universe and yet probabilistically there's no difference so um, you should know what they mean so now this brings us to one of the most important theorems in probability theory um, Bayes theorem which is combining a bunch of the other rules we had uh, in the previous slides into kind of one result that lets us turn that conditional probability around. Um, so uh, the canonical way to think about it is that um, given some hypothesis, um, H, this thing that you think could be true, um, and some evidence, E, which is supports it being true, say, um, in terms of a diagnosis for a disease, maybe we think um, this patient might have cancer and the test results provide support for that. So what is the likelihood, the probability that um, the patient has cancer given the test results that we've received, right? We wanna be able to define this distribution and we don't know this distribution, right? This is the posterior, we call it. So this is usually the thing we want to be able to do, right? We wanna be able to answer questions about the probability of this hypothesis given various evidence, right, or observations. Um, <clears throat> and so uh, the way that works out in terms of um, probability is that um, we can have this relationship here where uh, you'll notice the, it's, it's the probability of H given E um, can be formatted in terms of the probability of E given H times the probability of H divided by the probability of E. Um, and you can derive this from the chain rule um, and the, the rule about joint distributions in order to get this new relationship. And um, it's very convenient because it could be often um, that this conditional distribution is something you can work out much more easily, right? Because in this case for our um, medical question, this is the distribution or what's the probability of receiving a test result um, given that a patient has cancer, right? So um, with the COVID um, pandemic going on, we're very familiar with test results and diagnoses. So what is the probability that, you know, this particular test, this PCR test gives you a positive if the person actually has the disease, right? And later on, we'll find out whether the person had the disease or not because it will develop and we'll be sure they definitely had it and we can say well that test was correct 95 percent of the time or something right so determining this um distribution which we call the likelihood um is often quite doable it's something we can observe experimentally and try it right when they're doing um medical um research with um animals um with mice they do something they change a gene and they see if that um, works and if they can detect it with some test or if it causes the um, the symptom that they have, right? So maybe some some uh, condition that they're trying to understand, they change a gene and they see that it always happens, they can understand the probability of this, right? Um, so that's good because we're getting something that we don't know how to compute using something we do know how to compute or observe, right? Uh, so that's the likelihood. And then the other two components are the prior and the evidence, right? And so evidence are, like we said, all of the, the things that we're observing. Um, in the most general form, these don't have to be thought of as evidence and hypotheses. They're just different random variables. So whatever the random variable is that you're conditioning on, that you're going to have observations of, that's the one you're going to have to divide by. 
and whatever one you're trying to um, predict is the one you'll have up on top, right? It is still important to know that you need um, the unconditional versions of both of these. Um, these could be hard um, to, to get, right? Because what's the probability of someone getting cancer? Well, we can look at statistics and just say, what's the probability in the population of someone getting this disease ever? But is that fair? Should you be saying, you know, people in a certain situation, a certain age group, a certain country? Um, this is almost kind of subjective, right? And then the probability of your test returning true, um, independent of whether the person has cancer or not, is a weird question, right? So often um, these are both hard to get, but this is the hardest. Um, because in order for it to, to really be worked out, you have to sum over all possible things that could affect it and cause it to, to, to happen. And there's usually quite a lot of them. So what are the things that it's actually depending on? Um, and like we saw about getting rid of the uh, like marginalizing else variables, you'd have to sum over all of those until you get this unconditional um, probability of the evidence. So many different methods of machine learning um, are trying to find ways to uh, get around this, um, to use, to come up with a good way to predict this, or to do some estimation where you don't need it. Um, one name for this that will often come up is called the partition function. Um, it's the sum over over um, all the possible variables of your evidence. Um, it's often represented um, with the variable z, um, and so one over z is your um, your your problem. Trying to get rid of that. Okay, but so it's very um, useful um, because if you, like we said, you're trying to answer some question, this is what you have to do, right? Um, now it's uh, called Bayes' theorem. Now about Bayes and Bayesian, um, an aside here, it's called Bayes' theorem. And there's um, kind of a split, uh, a different, two different ways of seeing um, statistics um, and answering questions about probability and, and uncertainty. And um, they really come across as almost two schools within statistics. Um, and this is the, um, the older one. Um, the original one is the frequentist, so we might also call it classical statistics and Bayesian statistics. It's not that one is more correct than the other. Um, it isn't really like Newtonian physics, uh, sorry, Newtonian physics and Einsteinian relativity. Um, they both are talking about probability and they're both ways to look at that. Um, the frequentist statistics is all about saying that all of these things we're talking about here should be counts, right? And so if we talk about the probability of counts cancer, it would have to be um, like um, a number of occurrences of cancer in the population um, divided by total population over time, right? So you'd have to do these ratios and just count it, right? So it's called frequentist, so how often do you see that? And that's the way people initially understood probability and uncertainty, um, and it's the way a lot of science works, um, and it's very valid. It's just a matter of um, having enough data. If you don't have as much data, um, Bayesian statistics kind of treats this almost as a metaphor and saying, well, um, what, uh, what, do you, what do you think it is, right? What, and, and often, if you, especially in more artificial intelligence, um, you would even talk about um, what do you believe? Um, and they don't really mean like a religious belief or anything, but they mean, do you have any information about this? Do you have a model, some model that you think is reasonable? And there's a strong argument in terms of cognitive science, um, in terms of human thinking and problem solving and animals as well, um, that we function much more like a Bayesian system because we can't collect millions of observations and, and compute this perfect ratio we have an idea that this thing's common or not because we've seen it um, in our life and that could be very wrong, right? This, this prior um, belief here could be um, arbitrarily incorrect. Um, but the thing is, so could the uh, frequentist computation of it because it's based on history. So it's, based, it's biased by your particular history and your own observations. And so there is sometimes a debate and even fight back and forth between these different ways of seeing things. They are in, I think they are both in unit, union and arguing, talking about the same thing, but they are different philosophies how to model probability and uncertainty. Um, and uh, 
you'll see a lot more of this frequentist classical stuff in in math and statistics and economics and biology although more and more these days people see um, Bayesian as a way to deal with big data and to deal with knowledge that we already have in artificial intelligence um, Bayesian is much bigger in, in machine learning um, because it makes the math work out quite directly and you assume you do have some information some knowledge but that knowledge had to come somewhere in the first place right and usually that was from a frequentist approach so just so you know these are different things and if you say Bayesian to some uh, cl very classical style stats people they may uh, Ask you start asking questions, so you need to know what you're talking about. But Bayes' theorem is not is not really part of that. It's just this uh, true arithmetical relationship about probabilities. It is the foundation of many of these approaches, though. Great. So if we have more than just um, two variables, we have to kind of reformat these um, formulas but the same relationship holds um, if some variable y is dependent on many different um, inputs and evidence so we have a model with um, many different inputs which is usually the case um, and we still want to predict y um, we could be saying you know here's the probability of, of y occurring given all these different things and maybe it's easy for us to know um, how x, all the different inputs, behave if y were true. And so we can, um, we can work these out. Um, but then we have to format it in this way. Um, independence. Right. And so, because the next thing is, yeah, this one makes sense. Um, so this one then, this one's, this likelihood probability here could still be quite complicated because you may not know the relationship between them, right? So you could start um, pulling them apart and say, well, I'm going to say that x1 is dependent on x2 to xn and y, but then I also have to explain all the other variables, right? Um, so you have to come up with the explanation for um, all the different um, combinations in there. One really nice one, if you can get away with it, is assuming that they're all independent. Um, and saying, well, if all the if all the x's um, are independent of each other, then all we need to know are these relationships about how y affects it, and and then we can get a model and break this out into something much more um, feasible, right? Because it's just a product over all of them. So you'd have uh, p x one given y and p x two given y, etc. Right, and so those might be much more feasible. And that's the model that I'm drawing here um, where there's no connections between them, right? If they were connected, you'd have stuff like this saying, oh, but I know x4 affects x1 and x2 listens to x3 stock tips, so they're all related. Um, but if it's really just, oh, you know, I guess if you're trying to predict the um, stock movement of this company and you're saying that all the other companies out there um, have their reports, um, but they're independent. You just say, oh, they're completely independent. I just read all the reports and that will tell me what this one's going to go up and I'll have a model based on it. And you could say, what's the probability of, you know, if IBM stock went up, would Google, if that Google stock went up, would IBM's go down? You could build those models based on history and then throw them all together, right? Of course, that makes this assumption that these are all independent and if they're stocks, they're probably not. Um, probably not independent um, because they're in the same economy, in the same industry. So it um, makes the math work out much more, but much more easily, but it may not be true. But we'll get to something in a minute about how that could be very useful if it were true. So that's essentially one way to get around um, a problem that could occur when you have many variables in these formulas, um, assuming independence. Um, another one um, that occurs, which I talked about before, is that um, coming up with the partition function is hard, right? So normalizing this um, by the joint probability of all your evidence requires you to go over all possible worlds where these had different values and seeing how likely this particular set of observations was, right? 
Um, so, um, so one solution is just drop it, um, right? Um, so that's a nice solution. You just say, well, just keep the top and throw the rest away, right? So the thing we have to do is I would just say, now it's no longer an equality. This is not um, gonna be, because uh, if you just multiply these together, you're not gonna get a probability, right? You're going to get a number, um, but it's gonna be an increasing number, right? It's gonna be a number that's gonna go up. And in reality, you know, there would have been some um, probability distribution that um, was, was going up or down. Um, and I guess, what would I say about that? That essentially, um, if you had two different points um, and end points, uh, let's use different letters, this is this is G and this is F, right? Um, and if we'd said that the probability of, of G and F were such that um, the probability of G were higher, was higher than the probability of F, right? So if we actually computed it fully and knew this whole thing, we'd say, well, G is more likely than F, right? That's the full probability because it's got a probability of 63%. Um, and it's got a probability of 34%, so we know it's bigger, right? Um, if that's all you care about, if you just care about the ordering and whether one thing's more likely than another, then you don't need this, right? Because you only need to know whether the top parts are um, bigger than another, right? Because this bottom part literally is um, summed over all possible values of the x's, right? So it doesn't take into account the y at all, right? Um, so if you only care about the ordering of two events and their probability, um, you can get away without computing that, and that saves you a lot of computation time, right? So it's good. Um, but it's not good for everything, right? Now you no longer can get a probability. You can say that G is more likely than F, but you couldn't say how likely, right? You couldn't say how close it is to certain. You just say, well, it's, it's more likely than that. Maybe it's twice as likely as that. But is this 10% versus 5%, or is it 80% versus 40%? You would not be able to tell because you've got rid of the normalization. Um, so that's another trick that often gets used, um, but it is sometimes a necessary trick because computing this um, could be exponentially um, complicated.